Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Director VMware William Shelton and Senior Director VMware Vinu Aravamudan. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to extend also a welcome to two customers we've that were kind enough to put a little reality around the story we're going to be telling today. And that's Glenn Harper from Sabre. Morning. And James Jones, who joins us from LabCorp. Hello. They're part of our design partner community who've been working with us and using beta form of this software that we'll talk about today. And uh, I think they'll flesh things out quite a bit by uh, helping us understand a little bit more of the business impact and the reality of what we're doing here from a technology side. Um, what we'd like to do is just set a little bit of a, an objective here. I know there's enormous amounts of information that are being thrown out, probably more than can really any person, including someone who works within VMware, can absorb and rationalize. So what we'd like to do is we're going to review some of the announcements from yesterday around our infrastructure cloud services and talk about how they fit together, what are some of the key objectives, use cases, and how that fits together to really get you to the point to build a secure private cloud. If you've been here this week, you've seen this slide, so I'm not going to review it in every uh, point of detail, but there is one key element here that's important in relation to the announcements of yesterday and some of this new technology we're going to talk about, and that is there is this fundamental promise that we want to, we think the best value, the best flexibility is at some intersection between use of internal IT blended with external IT. To achieve that goal, there's lots of components. There's interface, protocols, transport. But at some point, there has to be a cohesive uh, compute fabric between the two of those. What we've announced yesterday is a product line that, when pulled together, is sold both into the enterprise as well as service providers. And that creates that underlying foundation so you can start to do some of these bridging scenarios. Um, this is your little uh, map as you enter the mall. Um, we are going to be speaking about infrastructure and, and what's sometimes classically called infrastructure as a service. Um, of course, there are opportunities to layer on some of our solutions that are what you might call higher up in the stack, but this is very much around infrastructure as a service. How do we take compute, networking, storage, and make them into a pay-as-you-consume uh, service? Why a, why a private cloud? Let's just clear that one. Um, why would someone actually want to move into this new model? And the way we've learned from working with customers, where they are actually finding this, if you will, scratching an itch that, that previously hasn't been scratched, is that there is a desire fundamentally to move into a model where you are providing more of a service and then focusing on the way people can consume that infrastructure service. When done well, we usually find that that translates into some combination of these benefits. In no priority order, we find that there are situations where people will set up a cloud service. They will have different business units making use of that cloud service who will actually have, find different benefits. And you'll find that sometimes the person setting up the cloud might have a different set of benefits than the person who's consuming the cloud service. Um, it, there are elements of cost reduction. This continues down a path that VMware's aggressively been on for the past 10 years and working on the asset utilization problem. But it also makes a far more aggressive step in the business agility space and making your infrastructure respond in a highly uh, synchronous way to, to the business needs. Okay, if you will allow me to spend a little bit of time going into some product. This, we had, I'm going to try and give you a map of some of these announcements that take pl took place. First of all, let's just simplify the, the cl building a cloud into two very basic components for the purpose of getting through these product announcements. Let's take it into building a fully virtualized, standardized infrastructure, and then another set of services that enable you to consume that infrastructure in a policy and, and uh, secure way, policy-rich and secure way. This all builds on top of VMware vSphere Enterprise Plus. That's our basic building block. Everything in dark green 
is going is either newly a new product was launched yesterday under a refreshed version. And the key point here is that this is not an approach of pointing you to a long price list and saying, okay, here's a bunch of very raw, crude components. Now you go spend the next six months assembling them and integrating them. There actually is consideration in various levels, some very deep. Sometimes it's just through um, sharing data stores where these tools come together so you have an out-of-the-box experience that enables you to stand up a cloud service. First component we'll talk about is VMware vCenter Chargeback. It's an updated version. We've just refreshed our entire VMware vShield product line, deeply integrated part of our private cloud portfolio. We have a newly announced product called VMware vCloud Director, um, which provides a, a certain amount of the glue and, and uh, fabric controller, if you will, of standing up and operating this cloud. We've refreshed the vCloud API to 1.0 specification form. That's a key part of, the port of what we view as, a, as a, a good cloud service is programmatic control. At this point, we have a whole bunch of new solutions that you'll find both in the external partner ecosystem as well as VMware that enables you to consume that in various different ways. One of which is actually part of the VMware vCloud director, and that's a self-service portal. We also see um, more ITSM, or traditional request form-based solutions to um, consume that, those infrastructure resources. The light green meaning this is not something that is actually launched as part of this product set, but we have both internally and with external partners tightly integrated solutions ready to go, and actually I'll highlight a couple that you'll find on the showroom floor. And then, for those of you who, who have not found in our ecosystem and our product set what you want to, as far as the model for consuming those resources, we also announced a new SDK uh, in GA form that bootstraps your ability to go off and build that solution that fits your business. Still need to manage this. We have two different models for managing and making that cloud operational. One is obviously supported by our uh, vCenter product portfolio. And then, of course, the third-party management ecosystem um, is, is, can be applied to managing things. And as you know, sometimes it will be a combination of both. But of course, that's, that's all products. So let's, let's stop talking about constituent products and move to something a little bit more of business value. And that's the solutions. What are we actually doing here? Products obviously don't move the needle. It's the solutions that are enabled. So what we've done is we set up for this presentation around really describing what we found are six core critical elements of building a private cloud. And we're going to use that as the way to structure this conversation and drill into each. The first is building on vSphere and, and scaling in an aggressive way. Next thing we'll introduce is in working on the, uh, the vCloud director project, we really found there was a need to create some new abstractions that were more about aggregating resources in a cloud form. So we're going to review what those are and how they play into things. We talked, we'll highlight our self-service portal, and we'll actually have a little bit of customer detail on how that's being used. That's one, again, of multiple different ways of consuming a secure private cloud once set up. Security. We've all heard this. Well, why are you not using a cloud, both an external cloud or an internal cloud? There's lots of elements around security that need to be worked out. So we're going to dive into that in detail. Need to close the loop. You need to have a model where if you're actually going to lead your business down a model where some of the silos of IT are broken down and we're going to combine infrastructure into some larger entities, you need to make sure that we can on the tail end of that, come back and have accountability on cost. And then finally, if you will, I would like to think about it. You've done all this heavy lifting. You've taken this insanely complex beast of IT, and you've turned it into a deterministic system. Defined inputs, defined outputs. Once you do that, it's, it's gravy. You want to put a programmatic API on that so that you can enable... Um, 
very responsive uh, solutions to be put on top of that that can adjust to business conditions, could even adjust themselves to the condition of a given application running at that time to go provision new v VMs or add storage. Okay, so let's start with building on vSphere and scaling up to thousands of servers. One thing we heard very clearly as uh, customers were looking at the prospect of how do I move in an evolutionary way to cloud computing is I have investments in vSphere. I have investments in skills around the VMware uh, products. How do I leverage that? So we started from there. We wanted to start from a premise of taking, if, whether it be performance tuning you did on applications to get them into vSphere. We want to make sure that that doesn't need to be, those applications don't need to be recertified, retuned. The persistence model is the same. This is one example of making sure that we're giving you a cloud model that is seamlessly blends with the foundation that you've already set. So when we look at the skills, you'll also see in, in looking at these tool sets that you're starting with vCenter, our um, vCenter server, which is used to, as our central management console. That's, a, that's your starting ground in building that private cloud. Need to get to large scale, order of magnitude larger scale. This is one of the significant differences when we were looking at what does it mean to be a service provider and how's that maybe a little different than running traditional IT. And this was one of the variables that really jumped out to us is we need to rethink the scale equation. So what we did is we stepped away from this problem, rebuilt our architecture with a um, completely scale out stateless application tier, very new, something you don't find elsewhere in our product line. And, and to be honest, it's not a common uh, approach that is used in enterprise software generally. Very common approach in, in web applications that have to scale up to tens of thousands of concurrent users. So we stepped away from the problem and re-engaged and vCloud Director has such a model. Got to leverage your existing investments. Um, for all the goodness of cloud, there's got to be a path that moves from the investments you've made to ramp those up. Um, so this is, uh, when we speak about this evolutionary progression towards the cloud, I'll just highlight a couple specific, if you will, contracts that we have established with our customers to make that happen. One of which is, is that these are standard vanilla um, vSphere virtual machines. Uh, if you have investments in how you manage those in-guest management technologies, that will persist and carry through. We're not bringing forward any type of new model in a virtual machine. You also can blend it in with existing processes that you have that might be used currently to drive provisioning requests into your infrastructure. We do highlight the self-service concept uh, in a lot of our marketing. We think that's a, a very important part of getting IT into that uh, very responsive service model. But that's not for everybody. And even within an organization, that's not going to be for every group. There's going to be a need to actually layer in your existing uh, ITSM solutions in use of this cloud. We shouldn't think about these things as having to be separate. You can blend them and you can piece them together as on a per need basis. Okay, um, pooling resources. This is an area that is a little bit less about how do we work with what you currently have versus some, some area we, did, we like to think we did a little, little bit of innovation. We stepped back from the problem and we said, gosh, what would be the right abstractions to enable you to structure your infrastructure in a way a service provider would like to deliver it. And here's what we've come up with that you'll find. We start with the abstractions that exist uh, within our platform today. Resource pools, obviously a very policy-rich way of dealing with uh, memory and CPU, data stores for storage, and a new one, port groups, uh, to represent networking. That was introduced recently as part of our uh, distributed virtual switch. But then we build on top of that. Those abstractions, if I will, I said, were really built around a model of an administrator and how, do, how does an administrator manage their infrastructure. Little less consideration about how they turn around and make that a consumable service. So that's where vCloud Director picked up and first of all introduced a construct we call a provider virtual data center. A provider virtual data center gives us the ability to organize our infrastructure in discrete service tiers and also to group 
compute storage and networking into one large chunk that you can then uh, allocate from. The canonical example, which I have up here, you know, gold, silver, bronze. Uh, this is a framework that then you as a, as, as a business can then customize to what, are, what does gold mean in your world? Well, first of all, it's probably not called gold. What do you want to call that? What, what's the actual service attributes that differentiate it from your other infrastructure service tiers? And you have the ability to represent that in any way you want. Above that, we introduce a abstraction that we call um, a logical container called an organization. Um, sometimes it's nice to think of this as a tenant. Um, what we do is we, we provide, in conjunction with the vShield technology, this logical tenant gives us an out-of-the-box way to represent, give you a very simple language to communicate our, to our platform how you feel about tenancy. So through using these logical containers, you are telling us as a platform vendor, these are separate, and I'd like them to be isolated at every level. By placing something in the same container, you're communicating that these have privilege to possibly run on the same layer two network. So the point is, and these are things, of course, you could do, and maybe some of you have actually gone through the effort of actually taking every provisioning request, and when someone comes in and sets up an environment, you go through, you, you create the, the um, VLANs, you, you create the new uh, LUNs, and you assure all this isolation. Very heavyweight task. We're giving you a very lightweight, logical way to represent these things so that we can then, behind the scenes, turn around and implement that for you. So in this case, I've got finance and marketing. Obviously, if it's an external service provider deployment, these might be two totally different companies. Within there, we have users and policies, and we also have catalogs. It's one of the constructs we have that is also fully multi-tenant. And then we allocate from our provider virtual data centers over to these uh, specific organizations. When someone were to log into one of these organizations, all they're going to see are the resources in their logical container. They have no knowledge of who else is in the cloud, nor do they have the ability to take an action that would affect anybody else in the cloud. Just good common sense multi-tenancy. And from here, they can provision from those catalogs into that environment. Okay, that's a little bit on the side of, of the new abstractions. I'm, again, dealing with this at a very high level. There's lots of richness in, in just some of those constructs we went through, and I would encourage you to step into some of the either labs or very, very detailed technical sessions uh, to go deeper into that. Um, so at this point, we've got a, a cloud that has some interesting interfaces and, and, uh, to it, but someone's got to use that. It's no better than the usage of it. So let's go in and talk a little bit about some of the consumption models, if you will. One that we demonstrated yesterday in the keynote. If you happen to have been at the keynote yesterday, we showed a model where you made use of that infrastructure through a self-service um, interface. And again, I just want to clarify here, when we say self-service, this is not a request system that then might take in, in an asynchronous form, drive a process that resolves a week from now with something being procured. This is actually, you know, right click, change this, updates the infrastructure, handed back to you in new form. Okay, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jim, who is going to come up and uh, put a little bit of, uh, of a, a context and reality around some of these technologies. Well, hi, I'm James Jones. I uh, work for Laboratory Corporation of America. We're a uh, medical testing facility, uh, like number two in the, in the nation, uh, basically $5.2 billion a year in revenue. Um, I manage basically the virtual services, um, so anything that's VMware basically comes through my group. And so what we ran into when we were doing the, um, the vCloud beta is... Um, one of the, thing, the big problems we were having is, uh, you can see on, on the board, uh, basically a physical server for us took 30 to 42 days to create. That'd be like two weeks for getting it, uh, purchasing it from the vendor, a uh, couple weeks to set it into a rack, uh, requesting IP addresses, storage, that kind of thing. Now for a virtual server, it was taking seven days. So basically, how many people in here, show of hands, um, have change management in their infrastructures? Okay, a lot of you. Now, how many people 
within that um, time frame also get dropped things that need to be done immediately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. So this is what we're looking like, oh, almost surrendering. So what was happening is, because of change management, we have to request IP addresses, storage, and when the things get dropped on you, uh, the whole process, basically, it would lengthen the amount of time a virtual server could be spun up. So what vCloud gives us, we have the ability to take the uh, IP addresses and pool them ahead of time and request a storage and have everything ahead of time and through a single, uh, basically create a single environment, uh, we can provision stuff you can see. It takes five minutes. Uh, now a story to that, um, basically uh, we're going to be going through some of the, uh, what vCloud Director looks like. So basically what had happened, we had the uh, uh, team together and we were building the cloud. We had just gotten to the point where we can uh, actually start provisioning. And there was this one server uh, that was supposed to be approved on, like, July 9th. And through the process of going back and forth and deciding on scheduling, uh, the system owner had basically scheduled a consultant to be on site. So that consultant was on its way. Um, the people were about to, to hit the door, and the request to build the server came up. So the Linux person came in and said, I need a virtual server now. We basically sat him down in front of this with no training at all and basically just over his shoulder had him key all the information he, has, he needed, push the button, five minutes he had that server up and running. Well, the consultants came in, they had no idea of all the stuff that was happening previously and then this server basically got put out there in roughly five minutes. And what we've seen is we've been uh, playing with the, uh, the beta software and everything um, is that we were able to create huge environments, um, multiple tiers with the networking capability, and basically create templates so we can put the environments out um, at once. So whole environments could be pushed right out. Uh, the other thing that we ran into, uh, we noticed, is that this is going to basically turn the way we do our processes and standardize things. So as we do it right now, um, we do do templ templating of like the Windows boxes, we use Kickstart in like the, some of the Linux uh, servers, uh, but we still don't have a whole lot of um, more standardization. And what we've seen is with the templates, uh, we are able to get the same boxes out there all the time and in much quicker fashion. But now we're, we're on the road to standardization just because we're using the vCloud. And it just kind of is a nice organic way to like fall right into... Uh, getting the standards and all the teams working together because everybody wants everything really fast. Great. Wonderful. Got it? All right. Great. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's some people in the room going, okay, this, this is sounding like we're, we're getting off the reservation here. Uh, we got a lot of delegation going on. Um, we need to balance that. So what I want to do is highlight a couple aspects of how we do bring this into a balance, where it's a delegated model, where you are creating the parameters by which business units will make use of this infrastructure without yielding it to a way that would compromise compliance and things that really are valid. They're not just process and bureaucracy, but are real important controls that need to persist as you migrate into the cloud. Highlight a couple here, um, quotas, leasing, um, we have over uh, 75 specific ACLs. Um, I apologize you can't see these, this uh, screen grab, but these are very granular uh, permissions on things from whether you have the ability to uh, cre you know, change owner of a V app or copy, move, uh, edit the properties of, of an application. Uh, we can get down to very granular ways that you can then roll up these into a role. A user logs in from existing LDAP solutions and or any LDAP interface. Of course, that could be Active Directory. We can make use of the policies that probably already exist in your Active Directory environment, match that with role-based access so that you can carry forward that in, that uh, those permissions into your cloud environment. Another mechanism for control um, is, is the, uh, what I think is probably one of the more effective uh, behavior modifiers. Uh, people are paying for what you get. 
Um, I know this is commonly used in IT shops. The things that are uh, least compliant and the largest pain are the most expensive, and then the things that really reinforce best practice uh, somehow are the least exp- are the, the uh, cheapest to get running. So obviously that's a key part of, of making sure that you have a closed loop uh, capability in, in charges. Also, you need the ability to have a concept of leases. Um, you need to make sure it's a closed loop on VMs. When a VM goes out, there is a defined endpoint for the life of that VM. It might be three years out, but as we know, there's many, many VMs that lend themselves, and, and these are a lot of times the VMs that come outside of your traditional processes. That is, you know, someone over in HR wants to do a POC on a new app over there. It's a three-month POC. Great. I'm going to put a four-month lease on that. After four months, we're going to start an email exchange of driving a workflow. They, of course, will have the ability to extend that lease, or those resources will be reclaimed, moved back into the provider virtual data centers. And then, of course, the the key one here is making use of existing ticketing systems. Um, Whether it be a ticketing system or a request provisioning system, you will see an example of of a... um, uh, such a solution in the VMware booth, actually at the vCloud uh, director area of such an approach. You also see a um, solution in the BMC booth as another example of taking a very sophisticated request solution and driving that into actually a Redwood instance um, that's running in their, uh, in their booth. Secure multi-tenancy. Okay, um, so if we still have your business units on board and they're like the promise of moving into a cloud environment at this point, probably the next question is going to come up, okay, how secure is it? Please, you know, convince me, and you're going to have to come forward with very specific evidence on how we are assuring that isolation between the different uh, business units. So at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Vanu, who's going to take us through some of the details there. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. So um, what I hope to do is to give you uh, just a quick overview of... uh, the different ways in which we, we've integrated uh, the vShield technologies to help secure vCloud director-based deployments. Uh, again, these are new products that were just announced yesterday, and, and there tends to be a lot of detail in these. I want to give you a framework to understand how these work together and, um, you know, talk about how these are integrated. So um, when you think about standing up these cloud environments using vCloud director, uh, just to, you know, recap some of the things that Bill mentioned earlier again, uh, you can think upon the organizational logical container as something that kind of uh, describes your tenants in a multi-tenant type environment. The, the VDCs are the resource containers, which is where you set up the virtual data centers, you know, within those tenants. And then VApps constitute groupings of virtual machines for the purpose of uh, a logical grouping of, you know, applica- they constitute an application or a set of applications. And effectively, what we're doing here uh, is, is to provide a very comprehensive integration of the vShield technologies with vCloud Director to be able to give you protection of these cloud environments all the way from the edge of the cloud where you stand up your tenants and your virtual data centers all the way through those application deployments, which uh, represent applications that need to be segmented, firewalled, protected, uh, have the right access controls around them. Uh, and all the way down to the very endpoints, which, again, need efficient protection in terms of things like you know, anti-malware, antivirus, whitelisting, various types of services. The goal here, too, I think one of the things, again, if you probably heard uh, Steve Herod uh, talk yesterday in the keynote, is that the, the traditional model of security doesn't really scale well and apply well to, to these cloud environments. And therefore, we put a lot of focus on ensuring that these, these technologies that we are integrating and building and, and deploying with vCloud Director uh, are much more virtualization aware, they are simpler to deploy, more scalable services, and they are adaptive to the virtualization environment, the cloud environment that they're protecting. So specifically, um, you know, the first thing that you think of when you stand up these environments is that as you set up these, these, uh, these different logical containers in your cloud environment, is that you want to be able to protect them and give them a certain level of isolation, again, in a multi-tenant environment, and to be able to provide basic services such as, you know, address space mappings, your dynamic uh, IP addressing capabilities, and your firewalling based on the port group constructs that uh, Bill mentioned earlier. And, and these capabilities are deployed uh, at the edge of these, uh, of these VDCs. 
The next thing you might want to do is then to be able to extend this environment out, you know, either to another data center within your own or within uh, you know, your own organization, or for that matter, to any uh, any other vCloud uh, based provider. Uh, and this is where being able to set up a secure, uh, you know, encrypted VPN tunnel and to be able to extend your environment so that you can start extending services that are integrated with directory services and, and, and other infrastructure services and to be able to do things like, you know, bursting out your, your resources and, 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 and having additional capabilities come into, come into play. Uh, a third thing you might want to do as part of this construct as you stand out these multi-tier applications and these vApp deployments is to be able to provide a basic load balancing capability against, uh, you know, web requests, HTTP requests, for example. And, and then when you look inside those applications that are being deployed within these virtual data centers, again, it's very important to understand, you know, what kind of... Uh, security groups you want to create for these applications. Do you have, for example, a set of virtual machines that are holding uh, information uh, that need to be PCI compliant or compliant with HIPAA regulations? Again, there's, there's various different regulations and compliance needs, but in a nutshell, you know, protecting those application deployments and giving them the right types of segmentation and access controls is a very important consideration when you deploy these environments. And this is where we bring in uh, the vShield app technology to protect those application deployments from network-based threats. Uh, looking at those endpoints, you know, you, you've got uh, um, a lot of resource utilization. The nice thing about what vCloud Direct allows you to do is really carve up your, your compute resources. At the same time, you want to ensure that those endpoints, when you're protecting those endpoints with things like antivirus, anti-malware type solutions, that you have an efficient way of protecting them, and you also give it comprehensive protection at the host level as well. And this is where we introduce this capability called vShield Endpoint, which enables you to do things like offloaded antivirus, offloaded anti-malware type protection. Um, and, and in fact, if you stop by uh, the, the Trend Micro booth, you'll see a great solution in action uh, on the show floor that actually leverages this technology uh, and, and delivers a solution to the marketplace. So in summary, you know, one of the things uh, we're really focusing on here, again, is to look at just as you stand up these, these environments uh, to, to provide your compute resources and your virtual data center resources, uh, security is baked in as almost a service as you stand these up so that out of the box these environments are secured and, and these services are very tightly integrated with Wakeload Director to be able to give you, you know, all of the difference in depth from going from the edge of these, of these uh, virtual data centers all the way down through the very endpoints on, on the inside of these data centers. Uh, these services are also fully integrated both with Wakeload Director as well as scriptable in themselves, you know, in terms of depending on the type of the management environment that you have in play. And, and so they're very, um, you know, restful APIs. Uh, we have many customers who, who, who've been automating these uh, on, on a large scale through these REST APIs. And lastly, they're also very tuned to be able to deliver on a managed service basis uh, in terms of, uh, you know, IT as a service being deployed by, uh, by our virtual administrator teams. Okay. And specific to vCloud Director, you know, it actually incorporates some of these services, the vShield services, uh, specifically on the edge, uh, you can think about the edge services being deployed as a virtual appliance, and these provide the capability to do, uh, you know, firewall abilities, network address translation, uh, DHCP type services. And, and these are all fully auditable and, and, you know, they tie in very well to different compliance schemes that you might have in, in place in terms of standard logging and being able to check on network statistics and so on. And these are very important aspects, again, because as you stand up these environments and you look at compliance and audit requirements, it's, it's very important to have these capabilities integrated into the platform. And it provides a lot of benefit out of the box in the sense that these are scalable services. They're highly available services. They leverage all the availability capabilities in the platform that we provide. And, and, and these are integrated services in the, in the sense that, you know, the traditional model, again, you're setting up, you know, a separate VPN concentrator, a separate load balancer, uh, you know, a separate firewall device and so on. But these services are integrated into an appliance, which basically delivers these capabilities as you stand up your cloud environments. So that's a very quick overview of what we have built in for security and how it's integrated into, into these cloud environments as you stand up these environments. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn, and he's going to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, the real-world implementation at Sabre Holdings. Thank you. All right, everybody look this way. Say cloud. <laughs> Thanks. 
Oh, you can prove to my boss I was actually working today. Put it here, see if we can save the presentation for later. Well, I'm Glenn Harper. I'm Sabre's chief infrastructure ar- uh, architect. Sabre is a global travel marketplace. We host airline reservation systems, hotels. We uh, connect travel suppliers like cars, cruises, the airlines that we don't host, hotels, to travel agents and to consumers. We have a worldwide presence. Uh, we are in about 60 countries. We have about uh, 9,000 employees with more employees outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. And so what I want to talk about today in this session is how we're using vCloud Director to improve time to market for our sales. In, uh, at 1.30, in room 1.30, we'll talk in more detail about the, the product we built out, uh, the vCloud Director environment we built. Uh, Jim Brewster, who's up in the front, will talk about the wiring diagram that was put together, the technologies in the stack. And if you find Ford Donald, uh, a true rock star in the VM world, uh, find him. He, had, he helped us make it happen. We started on July 4th, and before the end of the week, we were done. After that, it was just a matter of rolling it out and playing with the product and doing t- uh, templates with it. So the product we used was Sabre's Revenue Integrity. Revenue Integrity is a product that takes airline bookings, puts them through a web server, then two app servers, and eventually into a database, and analyzes those bookings for... Uh, fraud, for bad names, false names, uh, does waitlist clearance, a lot of back-end processing for the airline. And what that does is saves airlines millions of dollars by keeping airplanes full, which kind of hurts us as consumers, the planes are full, but it keeps prices down in a competitive market. These are back-end processes that run a, on, on x86 servers today. We have a virtualized environment with one app server, two data, two app, uh, one web server, two app servers, and a database server. We package those together as a single virtual application, a vApp, and that allowed our developers to clone the environment multiple times for dev, test, and versioning. The idea that we're doing here with the sales and marketing team is by having self-provisioning by non-technical users, the sales team could create a demonstration environment for a customer in the customer's office. In the traditional model, we have physical servers that are dedicated for a customer demonstration environment. They would have to schedule those environments uh, per customer, kind of like a library book, only one at a time. What we were able to do, what, what we're planning to do with this is actually build it so that the sales team can check out the application they want to demonstrate in the customer's office while they're there, have it provisioned, show them it works, and let them run it for a fixed period of time. In the demonstration that James put up, you saw that there was an expiration date on a running VM. So you set it as the 30-day evaluation period. It runs for 30 days. It shuts itself down. It stays on disk for another set of time. If they want it, we can spin it back up. If not, we can delete it from disk and free up the space. But allowing our end users, in this case a non-technical user, to self-provision takes a lot of time and effort out of our ops team. It puts the, puts the work into the front line where it's needed. So it's a just-in-time virtual environment. So it's, it's a big deal for the IT teams for this. We go through a traditional request stack. You put in a ticket for it. It goes to an ops team. The ops team interviews the person. What do you need? Is it a web server? Is it an app server? Is it a database server? Which operating system do you want? And this can go back and forth. So there's a lot of human time in there by actually allowing our dev teams and technical teams to pick from a catalog or prove versions of software. It saves us quite a bit of time. We are highly virtualized in our development environment today. We've got about 1,400 virtual machines. What we're going to do now that the, the product is production and available out in the, as, a, as a running product, we're going to take the 1,400 virtual machines and put them in a cloud environment. What that means is we'll have a catalog of standard apps that people can choose from. Instead of having to request them from the, the ops team, they will choose when they want it. They run it, run it for a period of time. Uh, they can either renew it or allow it to self, uh, self-destruct in a way. And then they go check out a new current version. So if you're an ops team and you're worried about keeping all the virtual machines patched, give them a 90-day expiration period. After 90 days, the teams go back to the catalog, check out the most current version. That way you're not actually having to patch running versions. You can allow the teams to check out current versions from a catalog of approved products. Once we've got this working, back to allow our sales teams to provision development, I mean, sorry, uh, to provision demonstration environments on the customer's premises. Then after that, we'll be running this as production environments. 
where customers will be running Sabre products in the Sabre data center in a private cloud. We can allow them the flexibility to choose a third-party provider to actually run it in a public cloud. Or if they wish, they can run it in a private cloud in their data center. So there's a lot of choice for our customers, whether it's in our data center, in their data center, or in a third party's data center. They choose the capacity, the pricing that makes sense. Sabre is actually benefits because we have faster time to market for our products, faster time to customer use of our products, saving airlines millions of dollars by using our products much quicker and in the flexibility of their environment if they choose. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Glenn. A um, couple points that were made I wanted to highlight because I think they're, they're incredibly important. One of which was as we were going through a lot of very sophisticated, rich security technology, I want to make it clear that this is really what's under the hood. Um, with this solution, by going and creating organizations and dealing at more of an abstract policy layer, something that you're just trying to represent my business, we're turning around behind the scenes, deploying that virtual appliance, configuring it the way you want. Um, in many ways, to an end customer, they might not even know that there happens to be an edge device deployed. This is something that you'd set a policy, and if that policy is, hey, I'd want to limit um, network traffic on a given port, we'll make sure that that uh, firewall is put, put in line there. And we have various different ways to configure the networking around that. Another point was that Glenn brought up this option value around being able to set up this system, and, and you know now it's currently running at Sabre. In the future, that could be running in another customer's site, and it could be running in a public cloud service. That's the key point around when we talked, started this conversation. These are the same interfaces, same tools that we are taking out to enterprise customers, such as yourselves. We're selling into the vCloud ecosystem. And these are, these are some of the very interesting scenarios where you then have that option value. Maybe it's not today, but you want to have that capability or that knowledge as you're investing and building out your environment. You're building it in a form and you're tuning your applications in a form that will be able to readily move into an external cloud service um, in a consistent, uh, performant way. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about pay for what you use. Or pay for what you get sometimes referred to. Obviously, this is implemented with vCenter Chargeback. Again, another example of a tight integration here. Um, when you install vCenter Chargeback, you, it is a separate installation. You're going to have one of the parameters of, the, of its configuration to point to the vCloud Director. From that point on, anything that is configured in vCloud Director is going to be exported over to the vCenter Chargeback uh, data set, and then you sit down to run reports. It's going to represent the configuration and the the models and the organizations and all these other attributes that were configured in the vCloud director. Um, we have one of the strengths of VMware, in my personal opinion, is, is our ability to do very fine grained um, control of, of how resources are consumed, in particular in the memory and, and CPU space. Uh, this is a, a core part of the value of our vSphere platform. And this is shown through in the vCloud director layer. Um, we have three distinct models for presenting resources. Um, since we have Sabre here, I'll use my airplane analogy. Uh, one of which is, is the, where you literally buy the seat on the airplane. You've got that seat and it is yours. And if you don't show up for that flight, you've still paid for it. Not the model that's obviously out there in the airlines today. We have another one where you buy a ticket for that seat. And the ticket says, well, you should be a seat waiting for you. Um, as we all know, and we've been on the other side of that, there's some conditions that might make it such, and it's kind of up to that airline to how aggressively they want to manage that ratio of tickets to seats. And we give you a toolbox to manage that same relationship. We call them guarantees on SLAs. And, of course, you can dial it all the way up to make sure that a ticket always has a seat and there's no issues there. But you can also start to study behavior and say, well, you know what, gosh, i got a lot of seats that aren't being used here, and you can start to um, become more creative in that way. We also have a model, what we call pay-as-you-go. This, I think, is best uh, uh, um, uh, demonstrated on the Amazon platform. Just a real simple, quick and dirty, um, small, medium, large, very kind of limited set of offerings. You pay for those as you use them, and, of course, we will charge on a uh, an hourly basis, or provide visibility for charging if you want to do that on an hourly basis.
Last key point here we want to get into is this programmatic API. Um, at this point, we have built this cloud. We've, you, you understand the security attributes it has. You understand some of the abstractions. In the end, we now have a deter, what I call a deterministic system. You've got defined inputs, and with those defined inputs, you have some expected known outputs. Um, that is really what we are trying to help you get to the point of. When you've done this, this is where, when they talk about elasticity, responsiveness, these are the benefits you get. One of the ways to actually extract those benefits is by having a programmatic API that enables you to, um, first of all, work with third-party ISVs who's built solutions that work on that infrastructure, as well as you might have scripting that you want to invest in, as we all have, and you'd like to have the option value of knowing that your scripts will run on this cloud, they will also run on, when if you were to ever go make use of one of our vCloud partners, that same script, change the URL, and that script will run, and you'll have the exact same result set. That's a pretty potent combination in combining your internal and external world, and our programmatic API, called the vCloud API, is central to that. A little bit more about the vCloud API, because sometimes it's, for those of you who are familiar with our uh, Vim API, which is going to, is unchanged. One of the common questions we get is this represents some deprecation of Vim, and that's definitely not the case. Um, we think that for people who currently are writing solutions to the Vim API, they'll probably want to step back and figure out what scenarios make sense to persist and stay on the, the Vim layer which, versus which ones can move <coughs> to the vCloud layer and get more of this option value. Um, but that will probably be done on a solution-by-solution -solution basis. But it's also very different from a licensing model. Right now, the Vim API is by license and by technology bound to um, our, our virtual center. This is not the case on our vCenter. This is not the case with the vCloud API. We've actually put this out as an independent spec. Um, it, it is implemented, and we hope our obligation is to always provide to you with vCloud Director a comprehensive, accurate, resilient implementation of that API. But you can actually go implement it um, be, uh, given alternative means. Uh, and this is, for those of you who are thinking, well, gosh, wait a minute, I know that there's some vCloud partners out there that have the vCloud API stood up, but this product has a GA. How are they doing that? That's one of the ways they're doing that, um, is providing their own implementation. Um, it's also extensible. That's an attribute of it being based on REST, which is a, the protocol we've used, which is relatively new but very web-friendly uh, very loosely coupled uh, approach to building integration solutions. And you can extend it. Um, we provide in the namespace uh, an extension area, so you can go in and say, hey, within my environment, I love the standardization that you're providing over all these objects, but I've got some things that I want to add on that I'd actually like to um, extend in there. So we give you a part of the namespace. You can just go in and extend it yourself, and you don't have to worry about down the road that becoming incompatible with something we might add in the future. We've also put this into the DMTF for some standardization, and you'll see uh, some form of this being blended with various other initiatives and come out in a standard form. So, in summary, before we move on to uh, questions and answers, we've been through a lot here. Um, we've, we've really loaded up quite a bit of new technology. We tried to get out of the weeds to a point where we could get through all of it and create a cohesive picture, but it's worth reviewing. Um, the private cloud is an integrated offering of multiple different products, well integrated, builds on your investments with vSphere, moves the dial in a big way on scale, gives you a new vocabulary to abstract your infrastructure and deliver it as a service, offers a self-service interface, as well as various alternative solutions to consume that infrastructure the way it makes sense for your specific need. It's out-of-the-box, secure, multi-tenant. By definition, when you boot this up, it is in a secure form. By just creating organizations and loading resources in there, it is secure and isolated from each other. We have an integrated way to close the loop. Maybe you're not ready to charge back. Maybe you just want to show back, but we have given a way to close the loop on that in a deep integration with our vCenter chargeback tool. 
And finally, we have a launch of a uh, vCloud API 1.0 spec, which is fully implements to give you a programmatic interface. When I say you, this could be the ISV ecosystem, could be you for custom solutions internally. Um, so you now have that model to, um, per, to bank on that you can start maybe slowly moving your um, efforts to and thus picking up the option value of any efforts that are invested on that API will pick up the ability to work with external clouds as well as internal clouds and enable federation between the two of them. Okay, so at this point, that is all the content we have. Looks like we have about five minutes that we left for any questions that might have. We have, I think, two mics over here if there's any questions. Thank you. Um, Self-service provisioning with governance is proving to be an uh, important theme of this conference in your presentation today. Um, like a lot of companies, we've got a lot of virtual infrastructure, but it's not all virtual. Right. Having a self-service portal solution that focuses solely on virtual puts our customers in a position of having to know how is that solution provisioned. So I guess I encourage and, and ask if VMware would entertain the idea of broadening the scope of your self-service strategy to allow us to have an abstraction so that our customers don't need to know that, so that we in IT then can start to virtualize more and more and more, and for them it just shows up as a faster provision solution right. in our portal. Right, right. It, it, it's, it, that's a, it's a great point. The, let me uh, take this notion of self-servicing and, and, and try and separate it into two forms. And to be honest, we're not extremely opinionated about which form it, it takes because, again, it's, it's going to be on an as-needed basis. When we say self-service, we are really trying to achieve a synchronous user experience where you, you request something out of the infrastructure and then it immediately comes back to you. We only know how to do that. We've only seen that type of behavior demonstrated in virtual environments. Um, and the reason we say, well, why would you get so hung up? What's the real difference between 30 seconds versus a week? And the reason we, we're, we are pretty specific about this is when we look at next gen generation application architectures, we see a lot of infrastructure policy and a lot of infrastructure decisions, creation of VMs, moving into the application tier. Um, and when you look, I mean, one of the transformations that we see with our virtual machine is that for next gen apps, and I know that's not the general case today, um, the general case today is a, is a VM, is an analog for a physical box. We think, we look out four years, maybe it's three or five, there's going to be a large number of VMs that really kind of start to look like programming threads. So you need to have that really synchronous model. So that's a little bit on why we've, we've kind of bolted this notion of, of synchronous to that model. So, but that doesn't mean that, that this problem goes away. And that's why when we look at alternative solutions uh, from partner ecosystem as well as from VMware, uh, you will see um, provisioning portals that are more of the request model, that it's, it's decoupled from an assumption of virtualization. Request it, and don't assume that the system's going to come right back with a result, versus it's probably going to go through a workflow that will enable you to provision physical gear. That is on demonstration, in fact, um, on, on the showroom floor, uh, both at BMC and in the vCloud director booth, where we are taking some management technologies that are more request-based, and depending on what you choose, it will go route off towards the vCloud API for that one experience and off towards physical gear if you go, uh, if a, a different uh, policy is applied. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, Hagen Finley with EMC. So it seems like a lot of the self-provisioning strategy, which I like, uh, is predicated on the idea that the organization has the funds and the resources to pre- uh, allocate or set up in advance a kind of cushion. Correct. But none of the customers I work with have the luxury of that kind of budget and resourcing, and so you get caught up in that same kind of churn. It doesn't if, if the if it's a self provisioning solution and you don't have the gear there, yep. then you obviously have this reactive thing that we're all trying to avoid. So, what kind of thought has been put into you know extending our headlights into being able to anticipate the requirements and deal with all the political crap that makes that so difficult? Wow, I'm, I'm totally unsuited to deal with the political crud. Um, 
But uh, you, you bring up a very good point, and that is, it goes back to this issue of, of responsive IT means that, and that you saw that the model, the way we built up that infrastructure layer, is we're pre-allocating. There is an assumption here that to get to that level of responsiveness, you pre-allocate, and then you get things into a logical tier, and then you have the ability to provision quickly, deprovision very quickly. Um, this is, this is a, a, a change. Um, one thing that we... One of the themes that we see in, in consumption of external public clouds is that nine times out of ten, when we say, what are you doing here? First of all, it's usually kind of a lightweight POC or nothing particularly strategic, at least on the proprietary clouds out there. But a common theme comes back on, why are you using it? They'll never come back with feature function description. They will come back with ease of access, the fact, the immediacy, this time, you know, decision to provision, as sometimes it's called, so we definitely want to, we're, we're, we're pretty aggressive about making sure we keep that model. I think it, at some point this is going to have to be solved where um, the business units are given enough visibility into what their future costs are going to be. And at some point, you're right, you've got to pivot them from a pre-allocated, here's an upfront budget associated with this project versus, okay, let's look at a, a model where you're going to pay as you, as you consume that. We've tried to soften that a little bit with these pools. So at least if you're used to every month there is a predictable line item of expense against your depreciating gear, you can replicate, replicate that with these pools and give more predictable billing. But again, it is, it is still a You're going to have to get them over that hump to um, have the gear there up front. Now, you can, given what we're doing here, you can become very aggressive in, in just-in-time inventory. Um, and there are cases where you might have a situation where, hey, within a certain service level, like I, I mean, one service level I can see someone constructing, and we would be able to help you en enable very directly, is you might say, anything, you know, you have a demand curve and you have some known variance, anything within, you know, one standard deviation of demand on a given month, I, ma I make sure I have resources to deal with. Anything beyond that fires off a workflow where you need to bring gear on board and now how you communicate that to the organization is, is something you'll have to demonstrate. You'll probably have to demonstrate in pricing. If I could add to it, it's, um, you could use hybrid clouds and public clouds to extend your, your, your in, in, internal cloud. It's, the, the VMs run the same in either place. So whether you run it externally, show that you still need it, bring that cost back internally in a private cloud, I think that's where the opportunities for the hybrid cloud and the, private, the public clouds come into play. Okay. Yeah, that's a, Thank you. that's a good one. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just echo it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Let me restate the question. I know we're running over, so we might have this will be probably be our last question. Question was. How, we, we talked about the, providing this management plane across these multiple different uh, virtual center servers. Can they be geographically dispersed? Uh, the answer is, in, in, um, technically they can. We do not provide reference architectural guidance on doing that. Um, there is the out-of-the-box reference architecture. The product has an assumption that these are located together under one, in, in one location. Next question. Then the story on how you'd, let's say you had another facility you wanted to interoperate with, that's where you would have that vCloud API stood up on both and you'd have some solutions that would be talking between them. Um, the last piece on uh, how do we aggregate all of these resource abstractions that we are presenting, the provider virtual data centers and that whole tier seamlessly blends across virtual centers. So that's where we can take resources from multiple virtual centers and move them up into that resource abstraction layer. All right, last question. We've got 20 seconds. Um, a quick one. I, I'm just trying to find out uh, what your take is with um, your developers being able to self-provision. In, in my environment, they tend to be fairly power-hungry right off the bat. Uh, how has that been for you? It's good. And one of the, one of the benefits of the vCloud director is you can give them a fixed amount of resources for CPU, memory, and disk space. And that's their room. If they fill up their room, they've got to clean it up to put more out there. 
So it's going to encourage developers, you can have whatever you want as long as you stay within your walled area. If you need more, either clean it up or buy more space. So I think the flexibility of them choosing what's important to run and when by starting up, shutting down, and doing that self-cleaning. Whereas today, it's, it takes so long to provision that they ask for it and they never give it up because of the pain of actually getting the next instance. With this, they choose what they run, when, and can shut it down and control their own resources in their room. Great, thank you. Great. All right, thank you very much. We'll be... Um, 1.30 in room 1.30. We'll talk in more detail. Perfect, perfect. All right, thank you.